Still Great. Coming. Good afternoon, yeah. everybody, Thank and you. welcome to the final session of what has been a fascinating uh, you know, afternoon of discussions and engagement. Uh, hopefully, you can stick with us. We're now going to zoom out from a regional focus to look across the venture capital landscape. I'm really excited that we have perspectives both from Asia, the US, Europe, and of course, the region. So we're here to think about disruptive technologies and trends in venture capital. Now, it's no secret that VC has provided transformative returns compared to other asset classes over the past decade. And that's why you guys are here today. You know, it's been a profitable and it's been an intellectually challenging and rewarding strategy to pursue. But it's perhaps also the most risky. And one of the interesting things we've seen is that despite the economic challenges and the uncertainty posed by the pandemic, there's been very little effect on the size and the volume of VC investments. Instead, <coughs> companies are being founded, funded, and unicorns are being created at a faster rate than ever before. If we look at last year, for example, global venture investment was $650 billion. That's twofold you know, increase on 2020, which is about $330 billion. Um, there's been a tremendous amount now of VC dry powder that's floating around. And it's interesting to think, when you think about what else is going on in capital markets, how is this going to be offset? How are you going to see the headwinds, stock market volatility, inflation-induced interest rate hikes um, affecting this? So what is going to happen? Is the continuation of this growth going to be sustainable? Are the companies we're seeing today overvalued and they're going to be stuck in a bit of a no man's land? And what does growth in deal sizes mean for investors and entrepreneurs? So first, I'd be delighted to turn to Drew, who's a founding partner of 8VC. He invests across stages, sectors. Uh, he does everything from vertical software through to biomanufacturing. To give us an insight in what he's seeing at 8VC across the companies they're investing with, the founders they're supporting. Are um, founders starting to get nervous about the current environment? And as bigger, later stage investors are also getting involved in early stage investment, are these ballooning sizes of valuations and competitiveness of rounds sustainable going forward? So, Drew, over to you. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for having us here. It's been an incredible trip, seeing everything that's happening here in the region. Um, so we focus almost exclusively on the early stage, which to us is really founding companies, seed, Series A, and a little bit of Series B investing. And we want to support them through the life cycle. And obviously, I think the, the last three years really have dramatically changed um, even just like the vocabulary, like what does it really mean to do venture? What's the uh, Series A? What does this really mean? It's like all changed. Um, and then the last three or four months have been an interesting reset in the public markets. Um, so I think the, the first thing that happened is that for really since the financial crisis, private markets were trading at uh, a premium to public markets. And this is and sort of defies what you would learn in a business school of capital markets class, but it was, it was the, the state of nature. Then you had a shift in 2019 where public markets started trading um, at a premium. So there was a massive incentive to go public. This was fueled by SPACs. And then I think also the pandemic pulled forward a lot of economic activity for these, for a lot of software businesses and, and, and other sort of disruptive technology companies. That has now changed again. Um, and so, I think in the world where public markets were at a premium, a lot of investors who traditionally spend a lot of their time in the very latest stages of growth investing, crossover investing, very late stage growth, and then public markets started coming down market. And I think that this, the, the maybe underappreciated uh, enabler of this was the fact that deal processes moved on to the internet. So there was an abstraction that occurred. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for Tiger Global. They've spent, you know, we've done a lot of deals together, but if you look at the explosion of Tiger's um, investing, and I'm just using them as a proxy for, I think, the, the environment, um, there's no way that they could have done as, much, as many deals as they did if you had to go visit companies in person. So Zoom broke cultural norms around the way that deals get done, and that not only increased the frequency that they could do deals and, and the stage at which they could enter, in the United States, but it also opened up the market internationally because now, um, you know, S Scott could sit in Palm Beach and do deals all over the world as opposed to having to get on a plane and travel. Um, so I think the, it's hard to kind of overstate the effects of both 
um, the, the the macro capital markets, and then the you know this this the sort of zoomification of deal processes. I think the big question now is, okay, people are coming back in person, so there's going to be some competitive advantage to relationship building, um, you know, especially in the early stages of companies' life cycles. And the second being, the public markets are now trading at a significant discount. So, if you're Tiger, if you're Co2, uh, you know, if you're Altimeter, and you have the ability to invest both publicly and privately, right now you're looking at the public markets, and they look a lot more attractive. So. While the trend that you mentioned was certainly true over the last you know, two and a half years, I think what I'm, not, uh, what I'm looking at is, when I'm advising companies on what to do is, you know, what's happening right now, and what we see is that late stage capital, um, when it's fungible with the public markets, has largely uh, left the ecosystem. Very cool. Right, so Ron, let's pick up on that and bring in a slightly different perspective. So you are probably one of China's most influential and highly respected venture capital investors, companies that we've all uh, familiar with here, Meituan, for example, Pinduoduo, companies you were involved with from a very early stage. And just as in the introduction, we're seeing this mirrored in China as well. We heard earlier this week that Sequoia China is trying to raise an $8 billion dollar um, you know, raise across four new funds. This would be one of, if not the biggest fundraisings in the history of Chinese venture capital. And this is again in the context of not just a global, but also domestic, you know, Shanghai and Hong Kong stock exchange downturn and a lot of domestic regulatory upheaval, specifically in the ed tech and fintech stages. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, public markets, public comps are being absolutely hammered. But just as Drew was saying, we're going back to in-person. Just today, Shanghai has gone back into a lockdown. They're going back. What does that mean for the deal flow and the opportunity that you're seeing in China? And how coupled is it to trends we're seeing in the West? Ron, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. A uh, lot, lot, of, lot of stuff there. A uh, lot of stuff there. Uh, well, first of all, um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure being here uh, for uh, last Four days and it's quite eye-opening. Uh, I think uh, you know, if I may, it does remind me of China in some ways. Uh, many years ago, in terms of uh, where uh, it was in its development, you know, people are very friendly, uh, young, uh, dynamic, energetic. There's a there's a you know there's a sense of hope. Uh, there's a there's a gravitation towards technology and innovation. So I think uh, I'm, I'm if I'm 20 years younger, I'll, I'll be a VC here and uh, maybe capture the opportunity again uh, in this market. And I'm sure Jado would be happy to anchor your fund as well. <laughs> uh, younger guy, younger, yeah. younger version. Um, but I think the, um, yeah, I mean, you know, China is in the news uh, so much that, uh, you know, it's kind of funny, like in, in modern day where information is so, uh, you know, uh, prevalent, I feel like there's so much, uh, let's say, asymmetry in information. And then there's so much asymmetry in the judgment on information. I, I think China is, is right in the middle of that asymmetry. Um, by the way, I think Sequoia is doing a smart thing. This is the perfect time to raise $8 billion. Uh, and uh, they can do it, and they'll, they'll dominate the market you know, for the next five, 10 years. Uh, the market is huge, so huge. I think people forget how big it is. I mean, the you know, $2 trillion e-commerce market, uh, you know, twice as big as the US. Uh, you know, gaming market is uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, despite the, you know, sort of news odds, crack, you know, cracking down on things. These are still huge, huge markets. Um, and a lot of the investors uh, in China are late stage. And they come in and out. You know, I think that's the misconception that there's a lot of money in China. Uh, it's true, but most of the money is late stage uh, in Hong Kong and, uh, and they come in and out. So right now, I think it's a great time to, to uh, raise the money. Uh, in the late stage, you know, the, the public market, of course, has been down quite a bit um, because of regulation, U.S., China, and all that. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're early investors in Pinduoduo. I mean, they had a record quarter. I mean, I think they had a billion dollars last quarter in profit. You know, its uh, stock is, at a, you know, since the IPO, probably the lowest point. Uh, it, it was good at $200. I think it's good at $30, uh, you know, <laughs> given the company is so much bigger today. So I think... Uh, you know, if you're a public investor, it's a good timing. 
Uh, VC, you know, we're early stage VC. We manage about uh, 1.9 billion across five funds. Our latest fund is on a $700 million fund. Uh, VCs don't really get into that type of um, sentiment. I think the ex experienced VCs, they, they put their head down and look for innovation and disruption uh, despite the, uh, the IPO market. Uh, you know, that IPO market only affects us seven, you know, six, seven years down the road. Sure, if you have a portfolio that's public, you, you, you know, you, you're looking at it, it's not great. But, uh, but in terms of our work going forward, there's so much to do, uh, in, in not just in China, but the, uh, you know, in technology. I think one of the things we can talk about um, is really the definition of China for us has evolved over the years. You know, so China market is still there, um, but I think the other definition of China is really the, uh, the Chinese entrepreneurs. All of them are very global in mind. Uh, unlike the Americans, I think Americans tend to be more domestic uh, oriented. Uh, the Chinese, I think from day one, they think about the global market. Uh, if you look at some of the top entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia, are, uh, come from sort of a Chinese kind of ecosystem, uh, and there are more and more companies in the U.S. that have that kind of uh, background. So, um, so, you know, what we think about every day is less of regulations, more of what are the dis disruptions in technology that's going to drive the returns. Sure, no, that, that's a really interesting perspective. And now, you know, Ron said if he were 20 years younger, he'd be here investing in the region. And if he were, he'd be investing in a company like Tabby, I think. So Tabby, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, is creating financial freedom for a next generation of consumers across the region. They're changing the way people shop, they're changing the way people are rewarded, and they're changing the way they're able to save this, reshaping their relationship with both brands and monies. You guys work with, I think, over 3,000 brands now. Places, you know, even on, on stylish guy like me shops, H&M, uh, uh, Ikea, all the way through to Shein, Adidas, a lot of the guys at the frontier of fast fashion. So you're now one of the fastest growing companies. You guys have raised over $100 billion, both in equity and debt financing. What is it that you're looking for from an investor, both global and regional, in today's uncertain but extremely rewarding market? Abdulaziz, over to you. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, everyone, for being here. And thanks, for Jeddah, for organizing this and having us over. Um, I think I want to piggyback off the last discussion and the last panel about what startups should look for in a VC fund. And it's really a mix, as Dr. Nabil mentioned. So it's a mix of local, regional, and global VCs. And each of them has a different value to bring to the table, depending on the stage of growth that the company is in. And so if you start off, for example, I mean, and, and maybe you start off with an idea that's scalable in Saudi, and then you want to take that idea beyond Saudi to a level that's regional and then maybe global. And potentially it's not, it's, it's okay to have a, an investor that's only focused locally if you're only looking at a, maybe a seed stage or a series A stage. But once you've scaled and proven the concept beyond uh, that, that this concept might work in other regions of the world, you should start looking at VCs and, and investors that can help you scale globally. So local investors would help you navigate the local markets and regulation around that, helping you get to that scale. Regional investors would help you then scale beyond your borders to other GCC countries, for example, or maybe uh, a Pakistan or a Turkey or an Egypt. And then global VCs would actually help you get the lessons learned from, um, from, other, uh, so from other, for example, companies that you're emulating to, to really not get into the pits or get really stuck in the sand uh, and sort of break into developed markets, which I don't think any MENA uh, startup has quite cracked yet. So the ability to crack into uh, developed markets or maybe a China for that example. And I think this is the next stage that we need to really focus on. And coming to um, investing, you guys don't just have regional and international sovereign investors, but you guys have financed Tabby's growth to date, both through equity financing and debt financing. I think the $50 million debt financing deal you guys did last year was the biggest of fintechs ever done in the Middle East, North Africa region. Of course, there's some unique dynamics at play with you guys being a buy now, pay later company. So you just tell us a little bit more about that and how developed do you think the uh, debt financing for startup spaces in the region at the moment? Um, uh, I think maybe just, uh, I, I think what, what happened was there is a need for buy now, pay later to have access to debt financing. So 
if you're starting off, so if you're starting off with an equity seed, you can only use that much money to build up the product and the team in the beginning and hire a few engineers to help you scale, maybe, or, or get a proven concept. But beyond that, buy now, pay later, you have to keep in mind is a very capital intensive and hungry business. So you need money to give money away to customers. And if you don't have access to that money, you might as well shut down. If you as a founder are willing to go all the way equity, then you will find by the next, uh, by the third or fourth round that your equity is no longer worth it. Now your investors know that, you know that, and you want to, and investors as well want to maintain the incentive of the founders to keep in the business. And so the need is there for buy now, pay later to tap into debt markets and to tap into any investor that is willing to open a line of credit for us. Um, and here is where maybe, uh, and, and so the need is there for us. And then uh, the other step is then to look at the ecosystem. Um, it, it is encouraging to find that, um, uh, for example, SBC and Dr. Nabil are working on the framework for uh, uh, venture back debt. I don't think we're there yet, but it's definitely, but it's encouraging to see that that's in the pipeline. There's more to do, I think, on the plate of financial institutions to open that up, but we don't have the time to stop and wait for the ecosystem to develop. We need to actually be pioneers in that and find solutions outside. Uh, but until the ecosystem wakes up, we need to find solutions immediately. And so here is where the, the latest stage of investor, uh, investors come in, which is the global investors, the one that have deep pockets and access to deep markets and can uh, syndicate deals for us that might not be uh, that might not be available for local or regional investors, and I think this is uh, and so the need meets also good performance from the company, and hence why we were able or lucky enough to get Sequoia on our cap table, who's opened up debt for us as well. And so, uh, if it's a buy now pay later, you're a hungry business. If you want to maintain that shareholding as a founder, then you need to tap debt and you need to crack that code and. Uh, Luckily for us, we, we were able to do that. Well, Drew and Ron, let's pick up on that. So you guys are both personally extremely um, experienced investors, but come from established funds with global reaches and reputations who clearly can have an important role to play in shaping and developing the Saudi and regional VC landscape. What is it that you guys are most excited about, whether it's technological disruption, socioeconomic trends in the region, and what would excite you about opportunities that you'd want to invest in here in Riyadh, for example? Oh, I can go first, I guess. I mean, I think the biggest thing, and this sounds um, maybe silly or, or uh, cliche, but I think the biggest thing that's exciting is the energy, right? So that, like, there's really the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the, it, if you want to have one, there needs to be like this almost irrational uh, exuberance with uh, starting things, a high degree of risk tolerance, um, and a sort of magnetism to the ecosystem where you have really talented people who have many other alternatives with the way they could spend their time, both professionally and, and honestly, that the amount of social time that it, it, that it is sacrificed <clears throat> to build a startup. Um, <clears throat> and, and they decide to instead you know, to, to focus that. And, uh, and so energy is a big thing. I, I think that's tied to something else, which is basically demographic trends. So a very young, well-educated population is going to be more uh, well-suited, you know, to take that energy and harness it into something valuable. And I think lastly, you know, um, the kingdom is just very well-situated, I think, around macro tailwinds. One, a increasingly sort of divided geopolitical world where I think the United States has, you know, to be self-critical, has, has um, made a lot of uh, mistakes, and a China which is, um, you know, increasingly not able to work with Western companies and vice versa. And there needs to be a neutral home, I think, in many ways for people who are interested in, in things beyond geopolitics, like entrepreneurship, hopefully. <laughs> it, Politics tend not to mix super well with really early stage startups. Um, uh, and so uh, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of just sort of structural advantages that you'll have. And then I think the big question, the, it's, a, it's a tremendous opportunity, probably the biggest opportunity that we'll see in our lifetimes around this. Um, but it's also something that has, you know, is relatively unproven, which is can you 
use the power of the government and the vision that, that you know, I'm very jealous of being able to set a vision, uh, you know, 10 years in advance, you know, coming from the United States. I think China's done a very good job of, 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 doing, of doing this, but can you build a, a, a bottoms up organic ecosystem around a top down vision? It's a, it's a huge opportunity if it's able to be done. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's along with the resources, especially on a per capita basis that you all have here. So that's what's exciting about it. Ron? Yeah, I mean, um, I think for this market, it's, it's you know, I've been on, here only four days. Um, it, there's, you know, if you put technology aside, I think on a consumer side, it's a no-brainer. There, there's going to be huge opportunities. Things like pay, they later, uh, pay later, I mean, we were talking, Jessica, we were talking about, you know, opening coffee shops. You know, uh, you know just, there's a company in China called Luckin. I mean, they had some issues because of, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, management issue, let's say. Uh, but the idea is good, and the, and the, uh, the company is going very strong uh, with a change in management. Uh, you know, just having um, consumer, you know, consumer upgrade in terms of experience, uh, convenience. Um, I think those are low-hanging fruits in, in some ways. Um, now, for, for us in China, I think, you know, we can certainly talk about different technologies and AI, robotics, and semiconductors and all those things, uh, blockchain. But I think, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll take another slant at it. Uh, I mean, we, we think about it in, in almost two, two buckets. One is, you know, what are the areas that the government want to support? Uh, when they support it, and they support it all the way from you know, giving grants at the seat level to a uh, fast track to IPO. I mean, you can have $20 million annualized revenue. If you're on the, one of the fast tracks, I mean, that's a 2 to $5 billion market cap. I mean, that's, that's a good, good day for entrepreneurs and, and uh, VCs, you know. So th these, are, you know, these are usually the uh, hardwares, the uh, hard tech, the deep tech, the AIs and semis. Right, so we, we have an effort uh, around those areas. And it's quite interesting. That's, I think that's a new experiment in, in venture capital. It's sort of a, a countrywide, top-down kind, of you know, um, kind of ecosystem building. Uh, to, and someone before this said to catch up in some ways right, to, the, to the Western economies. Uh, so there, there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, and then, um, then the other bucket is we back really, really um, strong entrepreneurs with crazy outlierish ideas you know? um, and those are usually in things like blockchain you know uh in, in web 3.0 uh i mean some sort of uh you know some you know in, in some sort of technology where you don't fully understand you know we have a joke in these type of deals you, you cannot understand if you understand you shouldn't do it <laughs> if you don't understand it you should consider doing it uh and a lot of those talents are looking at global markets like i mentioned and a lot of those talents are setting up offices you know, in Shanghai, in Singapore, in San Diego, in Austin. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a very, I don't know if you see that in the U.S., but we see that in China uh, of a really a, uh, going very global and very decentralized, not necessarily in Web 3.0, but in any company, you know, really leveraging resources around the world where the CEO may be based in Asia. Um, and uh, I think what keeps these companies together, there's sort of, in our view, a, a sort of a, a Chinese way of doing business, very aggressive, very hungry, um, you know, work, you know, 18 hours a day and uh, uh, cutthroat kind of way of doing something. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's, you know, th those are, um, you know, things we're thinking about today. Yeah. yeah. Just to dig a bit deeper on that, I think, um, you know, you mentioned the parallels between a lot of the five-year plans and long-term technology and capability mapping that the government in China does in a very public way. And I suppose similar to some of the investors in the audience today, Vision 2030 has not just articulated a high level strategy, it's also uh, defined some critical levels of interest in building a competitive, sustainable and integrated technology ecosystem. How different is it investing essentially alongside or riding the waves of government support as you do sometimes? Whereas I imagine for Drew, when the US government gets interested yeah. in what you're doing, it's normally a bad sign. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, we have a, you know, we have a saying, not, not everything the government likes makes money. Yeah. So within that framework, there's still heavy competition. 
uh, and it's very unique to China. I mean, they, uh, they, they set the framework and let the, let the players play, you know, and, and they, uh, duke it out. And you got to still uh, find the right type of entrepreneurs and the right technology. Um, so uh, within that, you know, it's sort of a, that's, that's what they say. It's sort of a Chinese capitalism. Um, and um, 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 I think all the forces of capitalism still still at work. Yeah, I mean, I think in the United States generally, it's not a great day when the government uh, takes an interest in your startup. I mean, and there's, there's, <laughs> there are exceptions. I mean, half of what we do is in healthcare, and in healthcare in the United States, um, you, I mean, you have to engage with the government. Um, historically, we did a lot in defense, um, and a lot of my business partners have started, I like, guess, arguably the largest uh, defense technology company, Palantir, and that required engagement with with the defense industry. Um, but I think the difference is that, you know, I, I think that this concept of Chinese capitalism is very, it's very, it is unique, right? And it is something that I think, you know, the kingdom is, is obviously paying attention to because the idea that the government can create incentives and communicate clearly what their vision is for the world and then allow bottoms up companies to compete around those things is is a new and interesting model. I mean, it's not, I guess the United States did that more in maybe the 60s, 70s around things like, um, you know, advancements that were associated with the defense industry, but then had huge effects across, um, you know, the private sector. Um, but outside of the biotech industry, I don't think we've seen that in the United States, uh, at least, you know, the last decade or so. Thanks. And now, Liz, you guys at Tabby work in both a heavily regulated space. FinTech is very heavily regulated, but you are also democratizing and working on different models than some of the traditional legacy players in this space. How have you found this, you know, at the frontier of developing not just a new industry, but engaging a new customer base? And, you know, we've got um, a lot of the decision makers and some senior people from the ministry here. Is there a wish list of what you guys think they could be doing better, what you guys would want to see from regulators, from responsiveness, capability mapping, how they're thinking of regulating the future when it doesn't exist yet? Um, that's a good question. I think if you ask any startup, they will definitely generate uh, a list of 100 problems that they want to fix uh, in the ecosystem. But I think, um, and yes, fintech is particularly special in that area because it is people's money, it's not a game, and then you need to really focus on how to make sure that consumers are protected above all costs. I think a few things that could be, uh, so maybe just to change the mindset a bit, I think uh, for a lot of investors and founders, you, the onus is on themselves to reach out to the regulator and say, hey, we we need to talk, we need to sit on the table. By the way, this is the data, this is our track record so far, and uh, if the data looks good and the track record looks clean and they, they have a, at least good visibility and good comfort that you're providing consumers with the right level of service with no sort of gaps and loopholes, then they'll sit down with you on the table and, and create that regulation with you as opposed to without you. On the, on the flip side, if they don't feel comfortable, then they'll probably actually micromanage you and step in and make your life a living hell, and nobody wants that, right? So, uh, so with Tabby, what we did from day one was basically uh, we didn't try to wing stuff out of the norm. We, we applied for a sandbox license at the Sama Central Bank. We went back and forth with the team. They said, we want to one, two, three. We provided that, we sat down, and, and some of the stuff they'll agree on and some of the stuff they won't agree on. And it's a mix, and I think, uh, just to, to add to the conversation that uh, Ron and Drew mentioned about, so where does Saudi lie in terms of America and the China? And China, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. So we do have this top-down government intervention and the need to set seeds in the ground. So there are industries that the government needs to enter for sure, for example, no private investor is going to build a train, uh, so the government needs to spur innovation in that and really put the infrastructure and framework for it. Uh, but there are some other areas that the government doesn't need to enter, and maybe they should take a step back. For example, retail. The, there's no real need for a government, uh, for, for example, a PIF company to create a fashion, for example, group or something like that. They should take a step back because there is private investor money that can do it. And I think, uh, and 
for us, what our experience so far has been, uh, you know, uh, two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, two steps back. It's, it's a bit of give and take with, with the central bank. Um, but what we've seen was encouraging. So they're open, they're much more accessible. Uh, some areas are gray, but a lot of it is actually quite clear for us what we need to do to take the, to take the next step. And, uh, you, and startups also need to understand that the other side doesn't really know what you're doing. And so you need to educate them. So you build up your company with the idea that uh, I will engage with you and I will proactively do that. I will sit down, I will share the data with you, I will show you that, you know, uh, we haven't been ripping consumers off. We haven't been charging fees that were not supposed to be there. Uh, we haven't been, for example, there's no leakages of data here and there. So if they're comfortable, I think you'll get what you're required to as a startup. And I think if you're a fintech, and you don't build that bridge between you and the central bank, you're never going to get anywhere. Uh, your idea will still stay at a seed stage and will never scale. And I think for at least us and, uh, and a few others like Lean and Foodex, they've really built that bridge um, uh, and in terms of uh, the regulator's visibility on the economics of the business. And another area of increasing interest, not just to regulators, but also some of the world's largest asset managers, is investing along the lines of ESG guidelines. You know, people are becoming very conscious about that. There are, in fact, funds that exclusively invest on an ESG thesis, both both in public and private markets. Some people say it's a nice thing to hide behind when your when your returns aren't looking so good. I'm really curious to hear from, from you guys, you know, firstly, how do you think of ESG both in investing, but also in consumer behavior now? You're seeing a lot of brands, especially luxury and boutique brands, particularly around the sustainable, ethical, and local axis. Do you see this as a big shift in consumer behavior? And if so, where is the return and value to be captured in this? I don't know, uh, Drew, if we, if we start with you on the investing side. Well, it certainly is a topic du jour in the United States. Um, I think it really comes down to how you define it, right? So if you want to talk about, you know, I, I honestly find the conversation of ESG so unbelievably frustrating in the United States that it's, it's actually refreshing to have it here because when we talk about it here, what we're talking about is, is actually technological advancement, right? So how can, you know, Lots of conversations about you know nuclear energy and the applications of that. Lots of conversations about how to make um, you know carbon-based fuels more efficient, right? And and also you know sort of the entire you know sort of carbon recycling economy. Those things are very interesting to me um, because they're technological innovation. So it's about shifting capital to places that make the world more efficient, that drive down cost. Hopefully, eventually. Obviously, they'll require upfront investment. Um, but take into full account the realities of, of what the world requires, which are things like energy. Energy is, 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 you know, wealth for people, and people who are the least well-off in the world are the ones that require that the most. In the United States right now, I think there's, and, and also, you know, Western Europe, there's a miscategorization of a lot of things and it's not about technological advancement, it's about political agendas, uh, which are very uninteresting to me. I think they stand in the way of capital allocation. They're causing massive, like trillions of dollars of misallocation, um, which has real and visceral impact on people's lives. And that's what frustrates me about it. But I, it is refreshing when we have conversations about ESG, because the, the acronym means almost nothing. It, what it means is, is how you define it and what actual areas you're talking about. Um, I find it much more refreshing, you know, conversations about real technological advances and making sure that capital is paying attention to those that impact these areas. Ron, you don't have to worry too much about the political side where you invest. <laughs> We do. <laughs> no, the uh, um, yeah, we, we've been pretty ESG uh, focused over the years, uh, and I think that um, I think the same thing in the U.S. I think ESG, more ESG centric or conscious uh, 
conscientious, uh, firm will have better returns. Um, you know, for us, we, we passed on a number of deals that uh, didn't pass out ESG. One deal, uh, I mean, they grew virally um, because it's, it's, a, uh, it's a password sharing platform. So, uh, so if, you, if you, 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 know, you use this Wi-Fi and you go to someone else's Wi-Fi, you can share the Wi-Fi of this room with, with the other owner of the other room so that you know, the, the, the passwords are no longer a password. They're, they're being shared around. And in return, you get Wi-Fi's everywhere. You know, that's sort of the, uh, the trade-off. Yeah. We asked the CEO, like, is this, is, do you see a problem with this, sharing a, uh, someone's password? He didn't think that was a problem. <laughs> um, I said, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's passwords are meant to be secret. So, you know, I, I think there's just not a, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a um, aggressive entrepreneur. And I think this company ultimately kind of went sideways. I think just the culture um, of, of the firm. Um, you know, um, we also pass on the whole um, e-cigarette market. You can argue mm -hmm. that's, that was a, that's a market that helps cigarette smokers. Uh, but we felt that was, um, you know, that was something that didn't, didn't really work with our, our, our philosophy. And, and I think that that was a financially sound decision yeah. as well. Uh, government came down on the sector. It's, it's really a lot of money lost. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's one. Just, you know, I think it helps returns. Uh, secondly, in the China context, it's quite interesting. Um, the, the, uh, you see all in the news, you know, sort of uh, all these companies are voluntarily donating billions of dollars to, to the government, you know. Uh, and it's, in, it's, uh, it's an era where um, I think, uh, you know, government is, is, you know, is pushing the word uh, phrase common prosperity, uh, where, you know, if you're making a lot of money, you should give back to the society in, in a forceful way. In some yeah. Way. So I think uh, for us, what our job is to uh, really have, help these startups to have an early connection with the government bodies because uh, if you're a startup in China anywhere right you're part of a community right it's it's good to have early conversation with leaders of the community what are the things they're looking for and how do you how do you help them to solve those problems whether it's a job situation or economy situation um, you know environment situation um, you know city planning situation you can be uh, you know you can just not just make money for your shareholders but but help help the, uh, the community and I think that will make good, good citizens in return should yeah. drive, drive, uh, drive, drive returns as well. Great. So, Abdul Aziz, quickly, ESG consumer behavior, is that something you're seeing? Is it rewarding for brands to pursue? Or do you think it's uh, going to be out of fashion quite soon? Um, no, I don't think it's going to be out of fashion uh, anytime soon. I think what, if, what we've seen is brands go more and more into, into that. And at, at least for us, for Tabby, where we rely on this ESG is the S part, which mm -hmm. is the social. and. We are aligned, for example, with, let's say, uh, the financial sector development program here, which, uh, and a key pillar of that is financial inclusion. And what Tabby does is create financial freedom and is catering to a market that's being neglected by existing incumbents and banks. So if you have, for example, um, you know, if you look at credit card penetration rates, they're very low compared to other developed markets. And here is where Tabby comes in. And uh, we're not financing cars or homes, we are financing daily purchases that can really help a customer spread that budget over, over a couple of months. And uh, that's really helpful on your, in your daily budget as, as a consumer or a household. Um, the, another interesting, I think, aspect is what we've seen um, Klarna do, for example, recently, which is launch a feature for con consumers to be able to select which brands are more sustainable. So you as a consumer now have a category that says uh, green brands, or I, I forgot exactly what they're called, but um, you can self-select into brands that have better, um, better, I guess, uh, supply chain controls or better uh, or lower footprints, carbon footprints on the environment. And I think they didn't launch that unless they've seen a trend in their underlying consumers that is pushing or asking for that. And, and so I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. How big that becomes, I'm not sure, but I, I don't see that going away. Well, I'm conscious there's going to be a reception outside about to start very shortly. So are there any burning questions from the audience? Um, okay, in lieu of that, one final quick fire question for you guys. So today, for the first time since I think 2006, the U.S. Treasury yield curve briefly inverted, so five-year notes and 30-year uh, 
inverted, and normally people see this as a sign of an impending recession. It was in 2006. One piece of advice, if you can give it to founders, fellow investors in the audience, what would you be doing now? Taking more money, hiding in a bunker, or carrying on as usual? Uh, Drew? Well, I think it depends on who you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that if you're a founder, generally my advice, and this comes from you know the paranoia of having you know founded companies and also having funded lots of early stage ones, is generally I say take the money and run. I mean, like company, the the adage of Paul Graham that startups fail from indigestion, not starvation, is uh, I, I think. I have huge respect for Paul Graham. I think this is one of like the, the, the least true things he's ever said. A lot of startups run out because of they don't have money. <laughs> and I think they especially do in recessions. So I, I think being well-funded is an important, very important thing. Of course, high-flying companies, you know, maybe grow too fast, but a lot of them that are growing too fast ultimately fail because they don't have enough money to fuel their growth and they burn money too quickly. So as a startup founder, my advice is always, you know, if the people are high quality or even if, you know, you can just stand them and they're, and they're ethical people and the price is something that is reasonable for the quality of company that you have, I generally think you should take the money, especially in an environment where you have rising interest rates, incredibly volatile capital markets, um, and you know, a, a volatile geopolitical situation. Um, I think other, you know, other different personas in the ecosystem may have different sets of incentives because they have more tools at their disposal. But if you're an early stage founder and you're playing, you know, basically an end of one game with that company, I would say take the money and don't tempt fate by trying to optimize too much on valuation or, or anything like that. Ron? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, as an early stage investor, right, it, uh, the entrepreneurs should continue to focus on the core things, right, building the team and products and all that, and, and not to uh, focus on macro stuff. But, but I think if you were to do that, it is definitely uh, getting money. I mean, uh, and I would, I, I think people make the mistake uh, of trying to maximize valuation. I think that's just a habit. I don't think people... Uh, you know, try to make that mistake. It's just a habit, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Higher the better, right? I mean, yeah. you know, but but uh, you want to get to a point where you have three or four offers. That's the best place to be. Not not just one offer. <laughs> you know that? Yeah. Sounds um, like you're negotiating against yourself here. <laughs> well, I don't I don't mean it in, in you know um, that way. But yeah. uh, but you know, I think I think um, uh, you know, so you can you can not. It's not the highest valuation, but you find the right partner long term. Um, the right terms sometimes are more important mm -hmm. than, than the valuation. And, um, you know, and, and not, not just move on, get it done yeah. and move on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, take the money. I think if, <laughs> if you're, <laughs> so if, if you're a startup and you want, if you're a startup and you're looking and you know there is headwinds coming, uh, then make sure at least that you're not at the end of your cash burn rate, you're not at the end of the lifeline, get them money, and then really rethink where those cash, cash outlays go. So if you're thinking of a new office, scrap that, you know, keep that on the side. What you want to make sure is keep the operating cost as lean as possible and extend your lifeline as long as possible. So any crazy ideas or role, uh, role uh, if you're any product features that you want to roll out that will require you to hire a ton of engineers to do so, maybe not the best yeah. time. Uh, and I think you should keep that as a motto even in the good times to make sure that you grow your company lean. But uh, And we, we've, we've seen that. So wh when uh, the, the global geopolitical situation started, quickly VC money, at least global VC money, dried up. And so we were lucky to actually be at the final stages of our negotiations with our VC partners and, and close that before, you know, uh, before, you know, all the powder went away. But uh, I think, yeah, uh, being well-funded is definitely key. Uh, being able to secure that funding and making that a top priority at some times is, is definitely key.
Yeah. Spoken like a true former management consultant who's done a lot of cost transformation. Well, on that note, please join me in thanking our panelists, but most importantly, our conveners and very gracious hosts for putting together this entire program today and the opportunity to spotlight um, all the different work that's going on in the venture space, the huge momentum in the kingdom, as you can hear, all of my panelists have been excited with. So uh, Ardell and the team at Jada Fund of Funds, and Sarah and the team at the Ministry of Investment. So thank you very much for staying with us and have a nice evening.